a list of such sensations commonly described by earlier participants in Leary's ongoing drug experiments. So, the rest of my presentation is based on my research with published reports as well as manuscripts, photographs, and session reports contained within co-inventor Timothy Leary's personal archives housed locally at New York Public Library. These primary sources show Leary and his collaborators working within a broader context of Cold War cybernetics research, applying the principles of feedback collection and looping systems in their attempts to collect psychological feedback from users, convert it into discrete pieces of information, and then use it to modulate user subjective states. Based on findings from my analysis, I suggest that contemporary debates around psychological manipulation via information technology need to be reframed in terms of a much longer genealogy of state and corporate research dating back at least to the 1960s. So, this particular machine was conceived and constructed within the context of, as I said, 1960s psychological research in the US, a historical milieu characterized by new theories of cognition and growing interest in experimentation with psychedelic drugs, as well as new electronic writing and inscription devices. And we'll go back to this slide. Scholar Paul Edwards characterized this institutional research culture as existing within a broader post-war program concerned with establishing American managerial control over the greatest possible geographical and social expanse. Building from Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver's 1948 mathematical theory of communication, pictured here, and Norbert Wiener's 1950 theory of cybernetics, also pictured here, Researchers within this context increasingly worked to standardize and to automate the collection of information regarding individual behavior and affective states. Timothy Leary's research, both while employed as a lecturer at Harvard between 1959 and 1963, as well as in subsequent years as a public intellectual, applied both information-oriented theories of cognition as well as mystical theories of religious experience to the study of psychedelic drugs. As a result, his research from this era provides an excellent case study in the early combination of self-actualization and military slash law enforcement discourses common at both the height of the Cold War era and in our current debates around online manipulation. Now, aside from Leary and Lindsley, the experiential typewriter team also included graduate student Ralph Schwitzgabel, who went on to co-patent the behavioral supervision system with wrist-carried transceiver pictured here in 1965, commonly referred to today as a house arrest bracelet. In 1966, results from the first experiential typewriter pilot studies were published in the Psychedelic Review, a journal published by Leary directed Institute for Internal Freedom. That article was later reprinted in an edited volume by Schwitzgabel and his twin brother Robert, entitled Psychotechnology, Electronic Control of Mind and Behavior. Writing together in the introduction to psychotechnology, the Schwitzgabel brothers invoke Norbert Wiener's theory of cybernetics to convey their aims in terms of control over psychological phenomena, stating that the term control refers to, quote, nothing but the sending of messages which effectively change the behavior of the recipient, end quote. Nothing as nefarious as we might think, something fairly banal, actually. The authors also take special care to note that such control can be exercised equally effectively using computer machinery, as we're used to today, but also with mass media and also perception-altering drugs. In terms of the experiential typewriter, the Schwitzgabel statements help to decouple popular conceptions of cybernetics from their current association with specifically digital information technologies, reminding us that electronic information technologies are important predecessors. So. Back to the experiential typewriter, Leary described the machine as follows, quote, let's imagine 20 buttons which the subject will push to record his reactions. One button is for thrill, another is for lights, and another is for sick, and the last is for dizzy. We then train the subject for hours in the code system until he gets to the point of automatic proficiency of the touch typist who can rattle off copy without thinking of what she is doing. Describing possible use cases for the machine, Leary affirmed the value of real-time nonverbal data collection, writing that, quote, if the observer needs the typewriter, sorry, if the observer reads the typewriter and sees that the subject is not experiencing what he had planned, he can immediately communicate with the subject and get instant feedback as to whether his intervention has changed the subject's consciousness in the direction of the plan, end quote. 
In other words, the experiential typewriter was designed as a general purpose subjectivity modulation technology, allowing researchers to monitor and manage participants' effective states. So in this sense, the experiential typewriter shares several characteristics with modern social media, especially related to the placement of nonverbal signifiers of sentiment on a linear timeline. So, if this invention exists within and exemplifies the genealogical tradition of contemporary tracking and control technologies, I should note that this doesn't mean that the machine ever achieved significant widespread adoption. The researchers' attempts at standardizing a code system for expressing subjective experiences produced a learning curve which limited the device's audience. Without a widely practiced and well-known key layout, it's difficult to imagine research participants achieving the level of consistent and accurate recording that the researchers desired. To this end, the experiential typewriter notes in Leary's archive show the psychologist mapping out several lists of abstract subjective experiences grouped into clusters of about five, one for each of the user's fingers, as we see um, depicted up here. These concepts include awareness of concepts such as the void, the body, the self, objects, space, time, revelations, hallucinations, mood, mind, etc. And research assistant, sorry, research participants' ability to report on the presence or absence of these abstract categories with comfort and ease would require considerable training and practice. So, to conclude, ubiquity breeds familiarity, but the experiential typewriter never became ubiquitous, and thus, it never became familiar enough to facilitate feedback collection at the scale that its inventors may have imagined. In one particularly illustrative example, graduate student Ralph Metzner noted difficulty setting up and running the invention in a small handwritten note addressed to Leary during mid-1963, which reads, quote, I do not know how to hook up the ET, nor does the recorder have any ink, end quote. So without widespread access to tools, documentation, training, support, you know, the usefulness of a tool like this is indeed rather limited. Today, however, the problem of ubiquity has largely been solved. Real-time data about user reactions to stimuli are collected constantly, both in quasi-written forms, like emoji and reaction buttons, but also in even subtler forms, like biometrics and GPS-enabled location tracking. So with this in mind, I'd argue that the current moral panics about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica seem to me like problems related to the scale and distribution of tracking and control techniques, rather than any qualitative difference between current and past discourses surrounding psychology, information technology, or so-called psychometrics. Thanks. Thank you. Oop. That's off now. Thank you, James. Um, now we have uh, Jeff Apple. Jeff? I, I was telling everybody today, I, I'm in philosophy of religion, and most of my presentations or conferences, there's no slides, there's no images, or people just get up and just kind of read it. And so yesterday, I was sitting here thinking, I gotta put something together for this. So as you can see, it was literally thrown together, it looks like. <laughs> um, let's see if the next one works. Okay, so it might just be that, uh, that first one. Uh, do with it what you will. Uh, so my paper is called, What in the World is Originary Technicity? Um, and I want to explore maybe some higher level political implications of this emergent uh, philosophical concept. Uh, my intention today, I want to make this as clear as possible uh, because often, uh, in the words of Bernard Stiegler, who's the theorist I'm going to use today, uh, originary technicity uh, concerns each and every one of us and thus becomes a primary question for the world as a whole. So what are we talking about for originary technicity? There's some uh, ways of summing it up right here. Uh, at the ground level, it's the theory that what we call the human being is always the product of its prosthesis, its supplements, and its technological objects. Uh, this means that there is something fundamental about the human tendency to exteriorize ourselves into tools, artifacts, language, and technical memory devices. Uh, more than this, our life proceeds in relation with these non-autopoetic or non-biological elements. The, uh, this means that technologies are not something external and contingent, but are rather the essential dimension to the human and its becoming. So put simply, originary technicity claims that the human and technology are found 
and a co-constitutive, irreducible relation where one element cannot exist without the other. Okay, so to better catch sight of what I'm talking about, uh, I want to discuss it in light of something which might seem funny at first, uh, memory. The question of human memory and its relation to technology is one that is as old as Western civilization itself. Uh, for instance, through Socrates, Plato argued that there is a qualifiable difference between natural human memory, or what he called anamnesis, and then artificial or technical, or what he called hyponesis or hyponesic memory, on the other hand. Uh, anamnesis can be thought of as the embodied act of memory. Uh, for Plato, remembering, reminiscing, recollecting, they all denote this true form of knowing uh, that is autonomous and free thinking, like this uh, image on the right. Oh, I'm sorry, your left. Uh, against this memory, Plato opposed hyponesis, or the exteriorization of human memory into non-human ciphers. So, a technology such as writing. Uh, these technologies, they help us remember, but because they're disembodied, they're artificial, and because they disable the autonomy of human thought, they signal a lesser, lesser form of knowing, or even a, a false knowing for Plato. Uh, importantly, Plato argued that artificial memory is pharmacon, or a gift that is also a threat. So while it's ambiguous in nature, uh, Plato sided more with the threat side of the meaning of pharmacon, a technology such as orthographic writing. Uh, it might help us retain more, but it simultaneously makes the development of our own memory, our own autonomous thinking, less important. So I'm going to come back to this idea of pharmacon uh, towards the end, so hold on to that. Now, Stiegler, he responds to Plato in two fascinating ways. First, he argues that the human exteriorization of memory has always created the hyponesic or the technological context and conditions for human memory to exist in the first place. So this means that everything from the first stone tools to ideogrammatic writing, to alphabetic writing, to analog and digital recording devices, all of these hyponemata are historically specific examples of anamnesis composing with hyponesis. This is to say that autonomous human thinking always has something to do with technological memory. So hyponesis, or this exteriorized technical memory, it always works together with, it interfaces with, and it's always co-implicated with anamnesis. They compose through one another. They can't be neatly separated. So let's take an example by Stiegler to better see this process. So archaeological evidence suggests that in the transition from the, the Zinjanthropic to the Neanderthal pre-hominid, so from left to right, we find both the development of a prefrontal cortex and evidence of the first tools. So often our tendency is to approach this sort of phenomenon uh, through binary thinking, or chicken, chicken and egg, which came first? Uh, did the tool proceed and allow for the development of the prefrontal cortex? Or is there something uh, of cerebral development that was happening that allowed the development of the flint knife? Stiegler suggests that they are co-evolutionary and characteristic of this dynamic composition between hyponesis and anamnesis. Now, to take a more contemporary example, uh, consider the practice of orthographic writing. Writing is a technology that allows us to record, archive, and transmit speeches spoken past. It's also one that allows us to think, to learn, and to transform, and to become something different. We are able to meditate on Plato's philosophy, for example, because he wrote it down, and because we have learned how to decode texts through the process of reading. In other words, reading and writing are skills or know-how that we adopt over a long period of time in order to set into motion. So once again, you can't neatly separate the technology from the way that we think. 
Now, following from this, Stiegler makes a second observation. If everything hinges on how exteriorized technical memory is articulated with anamnesis, then we're left with a collective question, not merely an individual one. It could be posed like this. How might the relation between the collective and technology, how might that relation facilitate the development of memory in composing meaningful symbolic practices and communal formations? Now, this might sound strange to discuss symbolic communal practices here, but remember, we humans live and we evolve by recording and transmitting our experiences to others through technical artifacts and support systems. So given the fact that I was, not born, or I was born into a world not of my making, my consciousness must be constituted and oriented by objects and practices that were not created by me. This is the same for all of us. Each of us is the product of traditions, of cultures and habits. And each of us have activated and grown into these experiences that were not personally ours through the technical systems. So collective memory is technological. It's not merely intersubjective. And I picked this slide because I think what we want to do is we want to look at the pictures of the individuals and say, these are the people that came before me, while ignoring that the photograph is a technology that helps us capture what came before us. Um, it helps us see what this, um, uh, as St. John of the Cross called, the, the great kind of cloud of, of witnesses, what these people who came before me, the world that they set up so that I inherited and get to then move on with. So again, just because I'm using him a bunch, consider Plato. Uh, we can neither inherit nor practice the art of philosophy if Plato's works were not written down, if his students had not engaged his work and attempt to refine it, clarify it, change it, reject it, and then pass on that tradition to us. Uh, or again, what we looked at before, consider the flint knife. Uh, Stiegler calls the flint knife, this is very interesting, uh, the flint knife was our first memory device. He says that the flint knife allowed life to preserve the trace of its individual experience while transmitting that trace through between generations. So this means that a knife is not merely an instrument for cutting, it's also a memory support that contains, it conserves, and it transmits an inscribed cultural heritage, right? Of cutting, of stabbing, of throwing, of killing. In fact, Stiegler argues that this is how we ought to think of technical objects in general. They are the condition of the constitution of a relation to a past. So in other words, we inherit and we adopt a collective memory through technological means through that which was recorded and given to us. Now, I typically take a lot of time, so I'm gonna jump to the end here and look at some of the political uh, ramifications of this. So too often today, we kind of see this binary thinking that technology is either leading us to all sorts of pathologies and addictions, or it's gonna liberate us and solve every problem that we've ever encountered, right? Um, Remember what I said earlier with uh, technologies being pharmacon. They are a gift that is also a trap. They are uh, a cure that is also a poison. Stiegler's doing something really interesting uh, with education and the ways that technologies could open up a future for future generations. Um, and one of the ways that he orients how we th ought to think about like technologies as pharmacon is through this, this question of adoption versus, he calls it adaption or adaptation. Um, and so when we think about our technologies, do they help us adopt a communal formation that's centered on various aspects? Stiegler says they ought to be uh, centered on uh, care or kind of passing things down, transmitting things to the generations, right? Or are they centered on adaptations Right, which kind of are always keeping us um, structurally dependent, uh, addicted, consuming, 
or, or even as, as some of us might be reading in the, the discourse of the Anthropocene, right? Uh, like a, a for real legit absence of a world to pass on to future generations. Um, I'll just show this real fast. Uh, Stiegler's one idea for education specifically is this um, school that he calls Pharmacon. And basically what it does is it uses network technologies to connect doctoral students who want to hang around and learn from Stiegler, um, educational communities in urban areas, mostly in Paris, uh, that are experiencing like really low test scores and are in need of some kind of boost, but they don't have the public funding for it. So Stiegler said, why don't we actually have something where we have students can come study with, with, you know, with Stiegler, they can kind of get what they want, they then connect with these students and teach them philosophy uh, wherever they're at. It's usually through uh, some sort of uh, uh, internet medium. And then during the summer, they invite all the students, both doctoral students and the elementary, elementary students together to have this kind of like three week hangout. And so they develop these relationships through the year and then they kind of spend some time together. So that's one instance of Stiegler saying like, here's how we can actually set up um, how technology could be a curative process. We can generate knowledge still, and we can do it without being stuck with kind of the addictive uh, aspects of it, while also passing on a heritage to uh, the future. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, next, we have uh, Claire Liebowitz. Claire. So if I were to unlock my camera roll, you would find 8,520 something photos. Clearly I take a lot of pictures. Um, and doing so unlocks kind of also this digital archive of my life. It's nicely organized in a chronological order and I can go back to any point in time assuming I took a photo and kind of reveal where I was. Clearly based on this screenshot, in December 2016, the Stroop Waffle gives it away, I was in Amsterdam. And earlier that day I found myself at the Rijksmuseum, I'm a avid museum goer, um, and I was particularly struck clearly by several of the pieces there. One, in particular, this Vermeer, um, I was struck not only because of the woman's kind of famous cerulean dress, but because one of my fellow museum goers, a man, he was about 50 years old, he did something that's common that we see. He went up to the painting, not just taking a quick photo, but he not once looked at it through the naked eye. And obviously this was something I had seen in other museum contexts, but I took a step back being in school at the time and said, I wonder if anyone has actually figured out like how and why we do this. Is it that we're habituated to our phone, kind of like some have implied, is it that we want to remember what exactly is the reasoning for it? And surprisingly, very little anthropological research had been done on smartphone photography in distinct museum context. So despite having a cognitive science background, I thought it would be cool to transform my Rijksmuseum um, anecdote into a more robust ethnography of, of this practice in the museum. And to me, the smartphone is not just another iteration of kind of how we photographed throughout history, but rather um, a completely new moment in technological history where because of this fusion of connectivity and portability, ubiquity, it kind of changes how we use it to engage with our visual environment. And to me, beyond the hobbyist interest in museums, museums are highly visual contexts. They've been quote unquote disrupted with photography. I'm sure if you go upstairs, I was browsing one of the exhibits and it, it had share this on Instagram, share this on social, but um, very little actual observational work had been done in this space. So, sorry, my slides are strange too. Um, so the museum context is of course highly visual, thought leaders, academics have thought about museums as a paradigm for thinking about authentic viewing, I think Sarah's going to speak about that. Um, but I just wanted to observe, talk to people, and actually look on Instagram to kind of predict and, and make some comment on why we do this, which I'm sure you all have insight into. So originally I restricted my pursuit to um, kind of the prototypical artistic ideal, which I would say is an Italian Renaissance painting room in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, but then broadened it to an anthropology museum, a natural history museum, and then to be completely frank, kind of by accident as a comparison point, a cultural history museum actually situated in the um, geographic environment that it is focused on. 
in the Jewish Museum Berlin. So for the purposes of this talk, I will kind of on a high level talk about similarities across all of the museums and then zoom in on something that I personally found um, surprising and distinctive about what I observed in the Jewish Museum and connected to Jeff's talk on, on memory and collective memorialization. Um, so these are all messed up. So again, it's the desire to remember, I'd argue, the rewarding nature of social engagement online, and then this habitual connection and fast-paced environment in which we exist that motivates this strange photography practice. So high level, when I spoke to all of those at the museum, those who shunned smartphone photography and not once took out their phone implied that it would threaten their in-person visual engagement as though um, to in exist in the present in a museum and truly authentically engage with your visual environment would be completely disrupted if you were to take out your phone. Whereas those who did seem to imply a desire to remember to use this technology to later return to the moment the way I might on my camera roll. Um, sorry. <laughs> So the social engagement idea kind of took two forms. One, how did people engage socially in person when they whipped out their phone? And also then, how did they engage online with the photograph they may have taken? So strangely, if you actually, if you observe the museum today, if you see people, even if they visit with friends, they take out their phone and they kind of step to the side. There's this whole like physical isolation uh, isolation and solitary existence that comes from taking a photo. Um, whereas those who come and, and kind of don't take out their phone, I observed there was a lot of gesticulation, which clearly I'm fond of, um, and movement around the piece and pointing. So it was a highly social endeavor to exist in this visual world without the phone. However, of course, those who did take the photograph, I'm sure many of you are taking photos, I'm not pointing you out by looking at you, today um, are posting online. They had motivations for engaging socially with some online audience. And as you might imagine, I thought it would be cool to do what I dubbed Instagram ethnography, which is looking at the public profiles of these museums. Um, what you might expect a lot, we're emphasizing their location, their presence beyond just the museum, but here I am in New York City at the Museum of the Moving Image, um, and their tastes, preferences, and opinions. And you may think it's silly to have this amalgamation of you know, pictures you find quote, beautiful or amazing, but if you take a step back, it's not completely unlike maybe Elias Ashmole, who was the namesake of the Ashmolean Museum, who back in the day collected kind of tangible objects to imply something about his tastes, his preferences, and his experiences, and in some ways it's this democratization of kind of a museum collector that's existed for throughout time. Um, and lastly, one cool thing, I spoke to a lot of museum guards who I would say do my job as an anthropologist of museums kind of 24 seven. And they seem to suggest that those who move around the museum taking photos do so very quickly. They whizzed around. Um, there is a world where you use your phone to zoom in, zoom out and, and engage in close looking. But strangely, whether it's the smartphone era of disruption and addiction and, and fast paced movement, people didn't do that. They moved quickly from piece to piece. So despite these ideas of just memory, um, social engagement and habituation, emotionality kind of emerged in the context of the Jewish Museum as this really powerful force motivating the desire to photograph. Um, I would say that the Jewish Museum, for those who aren't familiar, it is in Berlin. Um, it's of course commemorating a atrocity that is powerful and moving, but also architecturally and a lot of the art there is supposed to elicit um, feelings of loss and anxiety. There are these places within the museum called voids that the architect Daniel Liebeskin created to kind of have no heat, no air, um, this sense of uneasiness elicited in the viewer. And when I was there, certain things, um, two pieces in these voids that were immersive artistic pieces seemed to spark new questions as to what might prompt this smartphone photography engagement of one's visual surroundings in the museum. So the first, um, this is called the Holocaust Tower. Sorry, it is, it is, is covered. Um, basically, it's this big concrete slab of, oh, sure, sure. Sure. Um, so basically, as you saw, it's this big concrete slab. It has one slit of light um, permeating the top of, of the piece. And in order to get in, you have to push this heavy concrete door, which I would argue in, in requires both physical and mental exertion. And as I sat there for, for a few hours watching people and then talking to people, I found they really weren't taking out their phones until later into the experience. 
And having experienced it myself, I would say that um, the emotionality of the piece kind of builds as you stand there. There's something unsettling about standing in this room that's completely dark, um, but eventually many people seem to point their phone to that little um, bit of sunshine coming through the ceiling. Could just be because it's the most distinctive point in the piece. I like to think some testament to um, the human urge towards fixation on the optimistic or bright and otherwise anxiety-inducing space. Um, but clearly here, photography seems slow. It was actionable, it was thoughtful, and that may be by nature of who's attending the Jewish Museum versus maybe a natural history museum where people are taking selfies with a taxidermy bear. But I do think it also implies something about here, um, the artistic piece itself in some way being this antidote to the fast-paced visuality that um, you know the smartphone era has kind of ushered in. However, as a counterpoint, um, another piece was this one in a void, which was quite different. Um, these, if you can tell, are faces of iron discs. There are 10,000 of them with clearly agitated facial expressions. And before you even encounter the piece visually, you hear this kind of dissonant, um, jarring sound based on people stepping on it. And as you anticipate it, you kind of have this profound emotional moment upon um, arrival where you step on it and people whipped out their phones right away. I personally felt anxious or unsettled when I encountered it and felt some desire to react by sharing it or um, depicting it online. So one high level, there's this emotional urge that we have to photograph, to re whether it's to reconcile our um, anxiety or it's to um, preserve how we felt, but connecting to our desire um, to remember and then to share and then changing maybe how our habitual connection to the smartphone ultimately manifests itself and alters how we um, kind of engage with our visual world. Um, something interesting on Instagram, this was confirmed. Many people use sad face emojis, a lot depicted this piece saying it was moving, horrible, speaking to what they felt um, emotionally when encountering it. But perhaps most interesting and related to Jeff's um, talk in some ways, a lot were kind of um, talking about the historical narrative and, and memorializing that through these kind of like digital tokens, but also their own memories of their encounter and emotional memory of what they were experiencing. Um, so despite, this is cheesy, but despite the fact that these are known as memory voids, they were anything but devoid of remembrance in how they were depicted. They were um, injected with people's memories of their own experience and also the depiction of the historical atrocity and, and moment that the museum was attempting to capture. And here's just a kind of poignant um, manifestation of that. People kept hashtagging to remember or never forget. And I like to think that beyond asserting that they were on vacation in Berlin, they wanted to remember how they felt in response to what I would say is a pretty profound piece and also um, say something about preserving the broader historical narrative here. Um, yeah, so overarchingly, at a very high level, I attributed the desire to photograph mostly to that tension in terms of preserving or shunning um, memory to preserve in-person experience, the desire to either engage with those socially on a very rewarding platform that is Instagram or Snapchat, et cetera, and just the, the pace at which this, this device has kind of injected itself into our daily lives by being always on and, and feeling the need to respond habitually in many ways to your phone. But also, as per the zoomed in lens on the Jewish Museum, this idea that different aspects of an emotional experience could prompt different smartphone photographing behaviors that change how we engage with our, our visual world. So I hope this is something interesting to keep in mind for uh, meandering around the museum and has given you insight into why we all do what we do um, on our phones. Thank you. Thank you, uh, on. <laughs> thank you, Claire. Finally, we have Sarah Rhinus. So yeah, thank you for that great setup because I will also be discussing smartphone photography, specifically in the context of Instagram, um, looking at how we are defining what is quote unquote real or authentic in an age that's very characterized by um, digital anxiety. So a general quick throw out to the approach. In general, I'm following a Foucauldian discourse analysis, also building on the idea of Jacques Rancière's community of sense, uh, which he defines as a certain cutting out of space and time that binds together practices, forms of visibility, 
and patterns of intelligibility. So the community of sense then being this kind of cohesive aesthetic that's developing around this concept of authenticity. The central question fueling my research, which could also be defined as an Instagram ethnography as well, um, is in an age fueled by digital anxiety, hyper aesthetic consumption, and an obsession with the authentic, how do we visualize the authentic? So here, a quick look at this idea of digital anxiety and kind of this crisis over real life, and specifically how there's this imposed dualism and dichotomy from what's happening in social media and what's happening in real life. Um, so it seems that we're essentially in this crisis of authenticity across blogs, think pieces, et cetera. We always see these things compelling people, asking people to unplug, get off their phones, live in the real world. Um, therefore, setting up the digital world is something that is somehow less authentic, less real. Um, as Nathan Jurgensen has written, one of the organizers of this conference too, um, the prominence of digital technology can often feel toxic and threatening, often inhuman, um, sparking fears about their effects on users who seem increasingly enticed and dependent on their expediency. So we see simultaneously an increasing dependence on these technologies as well as an increasing fear of what being involved with these technologies causes. So even while obsessed and consumed with social media and digital technology, we're also consuming messages that tell us that this behavior is somehow disconnected from reality, leading to this fragmented sense of self. So the constant use of social media and iPhone photography um, has subjectivized us to process and perform the self through the hyper-production and hyper-consumption of images. So then dealing with this anxiety over the authentic, we then of course process and come to terms with this anxiety through images as well. So looking here, um, there are currently almost 25 million photos with the hashtag liveauthentic. Though the aesthetic that I'll be discussing definitely seeps beyond this hashtag and exists in physical spaces, across advertising, et cetera, this provides a pretty centralized look at a lot of the visual thematics um, and also how people are self-defining certain experiences, certain imagery as authentic. Uh, some of the related hashtags include things like wanderlust, live folk, live outdoors, the art of slow living. So visual similarities are here, kind of the categorization of these images is clear. Um, and then, yeah, just important to remember that on Instagram, every photo operates both as an individual post, but also as a part of a collective narrative through its appearance both on the grids of personal profiles and then also when they're tethered together by hashtags such as live authentic that speak to the idea of a certain kind of lifestyle. And as these hashtags proliferate, there's mutual mimicry that occurs and it becomes almost indistinguishable who posted this, if it's a professional photographer, it's an, if it's an advertisement or if it's a casual user. So together, um, this imagery under Live Authentic and many other places um, kind of develops this visual consensus around what the very concept of authenticity looks like in a digital age. Um, so then this forms what Ranciere would call a community of sense, which I re referenced before that's gathered by this Live Authentic hashtag. So we see then an emerging normative understanding and a really distinct visual grammar over what qualifies as authentic. Um, as Sarah Bennett Weiser says in her book, Authentic, the Politics of Ambivalence in Brand Culture, contemporary US society hungers for that which feels authentic. And we continue to invest in the, no the notion that there are these authentic spaces out there that we can access and that we can consume, but they always feel kind of vaguely out of reach. Uh, quickly looking at some of the visual themes uh, around Live Authentic and what I'm dubbing the authenticity aesthetic. Nature imagery, one of my favorite themes is like the back of people's heads. <laughs> Just all, all, like half of the pictures are the back of people's heads, specifically a lot of women in fields, like standing in fields, the back of their head, kind of assuming this unaware look that they're not aware of the technology that's producing that image. Um, Again, then that soft faded nostalgic look, which is characteristic of early aesthetics of Instagram and film photography, a feature of artisanal crafts, coffee specifically, not Dunkin' Donuts, which is not authentic, but this like third wave coffee culture of kind of handcrafted espresso drinks, um, 
bougie, minimalist coffee shop, etc. cetera. Uh, wander less travel imagery and in general, thin white bodies dominating these spaces. And so there's this tactile, artisanal, nostalgic feel that dominates this aesthetic. Um, and these are sort of a visual manifestation of how our concept of authenticity is founded around this wistful longing for this imagined space in the past or this imagined space beyond us, this kind of fanciful imagery of this slow-paced, simple, wholesome living. Live Authentic then serves both as a visual genre and also a morally charged call to action to be more real than I suppose everyone who's hashtag live inauthentic. Um, so it becomes a call to action to be more real than the other people on your social media feeds and to participate kind of in this. Um, so again, as with any public aesthetic, we must not only look at what is within the frame and what is made visible, but what is intentionally and repeatedly left out beyond the frame and what is rendered invisible. So looking at what is rendered invisible in the visual grammar of the authentic. Um, so though these images are obviously created and viewed through smartphones, modern technology is noticeably absent from these photographs. Eschewing sleek skylines and images of digital devices, these images attempt to capture this world that's above, beyond, or before technology. Despite the fact that their existence is predicated on advanced technology, these images would not circulate the way that they do. They would not have developed such a cohesive aesthetic if not for both creating, producing, and consuming these images through very advanced mobile photography technology. So using digital technology, the authenticity aesthetic that's arisen visually excludes digital technology from its uh, definition of the authentic. So essentially, um, I'm suggesting that we use photography and social media as a self-soothing practice. So performing our own authenticity for ourselves and others via photography is a self-soothing soothing in the face of this widespread digital anxiety. So in this world where we feel fragmented, that we increasingly spend more time tethered to our devices, but also consume think pieces that say that that's not real and that's not the real us, we then have this fragmented sense of self that we're urgently trying to kind of subdue a little bit or make a little bit more cohesive. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through identifying aesthetics um, that feel more rooted. Um, so as Susan Sontag writes, photography is often not used uh, artistically, but typically as a social right, a defense against anxiety, and a tool of power. So we have the astronomic rise of digital photography and social media platforms that are disseminating images and shaping our subjectivity. Imaging everyday life becomes integral to our identity performance and our self-understanding. So we find a respite in this image that we're projecting of ourselves and we are simultaneously broadcasting it out and consuming it to ourselves to kind of have this self-soothing cycle. Um, and yeah, so this, in a world where we're being told that the real is somehow different than the digital, we're trying to create digital, digital imagery that denies that it's created by the digital. Uh, so essentially people are using digital technology to create and consume an analog fantasy. It's no coincidence that this aesthetic is dominating in a time that we're seeing the resurgence of vinyl, the resurgence of film, the resurgence of artisanal crafts and people pickling in Brooklyn and things like that. Um, we're kind of grasping at images and practices that seem to have a weight of realness. Um, this tactility is a really common theme in a lot of what's being imaged. And so what I think is most interesting about this aesthetic is that at once it positions itself as a defiant reaction to a device saturated world, but at the same time it is a full surrender because it's participating in this aesthetic and this visual grammar that's been purely created through these digital spaces. And in general, this exposes how our digital and our physical activities are inextricably intertwined. So even if I'm sitting on a mountain with no Wi-Fi access, I'm looking out and processing what I'm seeing through the framing and the context of live authentic, my Instagram feed, et cetera. So even in this space that we may consider ourselves 
in the physical and not in the digital, we're still projecting our digital sensibilities, our aesthetic tastes curated by digital spaces um, as we're interacting with these kind of potentially like pure and untouched spaces that remain uh, not influenced negatively by technology. So I really see that each of these photos that exist on these feeds really carry with them the specter of the technology that has created them while at the same time kind of trying to disown and push back against that, therefore kind of further fragmenting and inducing that digital anxiety discussed at the beginning. Because the way that we're trying to solve for it is by saying, yes, the only way to be authentic is to live in this reclaimed wood, adventuresome travel blog lifestyle, but then we're also attaching ourselves more and more and more to the editing tools and the photography on our phones as we also point to those as the problem. So I wanna end by something that I'm still exploring but I think is an important question to raise and problem problematizing this idea of authenticity beyond just that fragmented sense of self. Um, but looking at how that essentially this aesthetic is also very highly classed and by creating a visual consensus around the idea of the authentic, it then relegates everything that does not have a place in this aesthetic to the realm of inauthentic. And dubbing something authentic also carries with it moral judgments and a moral superiority. Um, so that's a dangerous thing to do, to define a very distinct, highly classed, inaccessible visuals of life towards the idea of authenticity while kind of dismissing everything else to kind of this world outside of that. So this authenticity aesthetic finds a very deep kinship with the visuals of gentrification. Um, and then you see within that, rather than changing our practices when experiencing this anxiety about our consumption patterns and our technological patterns, that rather than adjusting those patterns, we then create an aesthetic that projects a narrative that kind of shields us from this need to actually adjust what we're doing. So as Sontag writes, the production of images furnishes a ruling ideology, social change is replaced by a change in images. So as we begin to feel this impulse towards potentially changing how we approach and consume the world and digital technology, we're kind of creating an aesthetic that projects this sort of protective shield around, I can't be doing something wrong if what I'm doing is authentic, if what I'm doing is real, and if what I'm doing is somehow more rooted in human nature, right? And then as, especially with gentrification, you have increasing displacement, but if you have this narrative of authenticity behind a lot of what's going on, um, it kind of, throws this red herring and disrupts the general argument about that and sort of writes off hyperconsumption in the name of authenticity as not the same type of hyperconsumption. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you um, to all of our panelists. Who has a question in the back? Uh, my question was for Sarah, and I'm wondering in what direction she sees this authenticity movement uh, moving towards. What might follow this authenticity trend, and uh, if there are any early indicators that we can pick up on on social media? Hi. Uh, yeah, so I think another thing important to mention is with the authenticity aesthetic, that that's one particular way with dealing with this increasingly mediated world. I think we also see that idea that you were mentioning before of this like post authentic movement and a lot of like meme culture or Tumblr culture around this like very net art or ironic or post ironic use of memes that's sort of taking the opposite direction of fully embracing like internet and digital aesthetics and seeing authenticity through then different terms, right? And then the question of authenticity also steeps into how we're dealing with people being able to assume different personas online, things like that. So I think that this has like many prongs, this kind of discussion of how we're grappling with authenticity in the digital age. I think this is one way that works honestly usually for a very particular class of people and this is how they're grappling with it but I think there's also many other ways that different people are negotiating with kind of this new digitally induced crisis of authenticity in some way. Uh, this is for Claire, so specifically around the Jewish uh, Museum in Berlin there was the uh, an artist made an exhibition Yolocost. I would love to hear your opinions about that. 
yellow car? Yeah, so there was um, essentially an artist felt that a lot of people who were interacting with like Holocaust uh, exhibitions were very disrespectful. And then, so the artist created um, new images with them, but posing in front of like concentration camps from the 1940s, 30s. And then in order to remove yourself from these, you had to email undushmi at Gmail. And so it was a very exaggerated artist point, but they made a very interesting commentary. And yeah. No, that's really interesting. And I didn't know it by name, but it actually anecdotally led me to decide to focus on the Jewish Museum. And for context, so there's a um, installation in Berlin. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but he, this fellow was describing it where... Um, there are um, stone slabs to, to represent kind of caskets and loss of life. And if you actually go on the Instagram feed, there are tons of tourists taking selfies with it. And many have implied it's sacrilegious to pose or stand on them. And, and, and they don't really know what it represents. So this artist superimposed um, images of killing fields on those. So that's kind of a broader context. What do I think? I think it was very powerful. Do I necessarily also think that the people who are traveling through Berlin with their friends necessarily are trying to be um, cruel or, or not aware of their cultural surroundings? Um, I don't think they're intending to be um, necessarily cruel. Um, however, does it matter if they're intending to be? And it's it's kind of speaking volumes to um, kind of how we socialize a, a historical moment and monument. I don't know. I don't completely know. Do I think the artistic piece was a powerful statement? Yes. And a, and a um, commentary on how we use our phones and behave with our phones to um, preserve a historical narrative in a certain way. Yes. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Also in the front. Um, yeah, thank you. I had a question about uh, thinking about authenticity and then the images that we create under the banner of authenticity specifically for advertising purposes. I'm just curious how that would play into the idea of um, cybernetic control and these authentic images being used as a way to control or like direct people's behavior and then what Stiegler would say about that as a way of like... Uh, I don't know, like uh, propagating some sort of some, some sort of way of being into the future, right? If it's a fake authenticity, but it's also being preserved in this medium, what would he say about the thing that that's educating the future on or about? Damn, that's a big question. Um, I think I'm going to turn that into, because I feel like that actually incorporated elements of everybody's presentation. So I'm going to turn that into a kick it to the group. Um, so let's maybe go Sarah, James, Jeff, and then Claire. And if people have thoughts about stuff, we can kind of like move through it topic by topic. Cool. I'm going to start with the first part of the question and then we'll see where it evolves from there. So specifically on the use of that aesthetic for advertising, uh, I think that that's pretty captured in the fact that one of the things thrown around in marketing a lot and a lot of thematics in advertising right now is like millennials prefer experiences over things. And so we're then in these advertisements selling these ideas of these anthemic lifestyles. And I think that that essentially is just reframing the exact same consumption patterns though, because sure, maybe we would say millennials prefer experiences over things and maybe we call Coachella an experience, but then all the fast fashion you consume to create the Instagrammable experience that you're there, the other consumption patterns that you're taking place of for that. So I think the authenticity uh, aesthetic is also a way that we reframe our consumption patterns in that way. So we, we kind of like alleviate that guilt of consumption by being like, this is an experience, not a thing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Stiegler, a big deal for him is that that's the problem that we're in when technics, as he calls it, technology and our relationship to technology becomes industrialized. Um, so for him, he looks at this kind of wide historical narrative of humankind and says that uh, there are always technical evolutions that disorient us that then we are kind of, they introduce like new cardinal markers and new orientation points that allow us to say, okay, there's these new things happening. How do we kind of create our collective memory based on what's been, what's emerged? Um, 
And for him, he sees that process speeding up and going faster and faster to the point where when uh, the Industrial Revolution hits, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the systemic imposition of these industrial imperatives to always be innovating. Innovation, innovation. We, always, we can't have anything that's, that's stable, right? So for him, that's kind of the grand problem with, with today is that it's, we've entered into this kind of capitalist narrative of everything has to always be moving, always changing as quickly as possible. Um, and I think it is interesting in light of what all of us were talking about of um, even what we were saying via Plato, Plato had his own authenticity versus what's inauthentic, right? And that's part of what Derrida uh, and Stiegler talk about is that uh, actually everything that that you might consider inauthentic, inauthentic based on uh, autonomous memory versus technical memory, it, you, there's there's no snipping of the two. You got to keep the two um, in light together. So all that being said, industrialization is a huge, huge problem. And uh, that's why he's trying to uh, introduce something that says, can we uh, not avoid the capture of capitalism? Because I think for him, he's like, it's just, it's hard to get out of this dynamic. But how do we, how do we start implementing kind of systemic uh, replacements that are based around not just mere consumption and innovating all the time? Well, that's a great question. It's a classic for the whole panel question, which uh, is always a wonderful move. And um, I'm inclined to answer by contextualizing everything that we're discussing here um, in terms of two things, competing discourses, which have a sort of dialectical relationship. Um, and they would be self-actualization and surveillance. Um, so you subject yourself to surveillance when you are trying to achieve self-actualization. And I think historically this checks out. We certainly see it in Instagram today. We see it if we look back to my historical context today in the 1960s with this strange coexistence of the New Age movement, but also um, sort of state and industry funded psychological research. And although I am not a historian of the earlier times in the 20th century, I think it even goes back further. We could think back to times when the church was dominant in the West, where you subject yourself to forms of surveillance um, through rituals like confession in order to be actualized or to be um, sort of absolved from your worries. Um, so in that sense, I would say we're just looking at a set of different masters from time to time. It used to be that your master was the church and then your master perhaps was the state or industry. And now it seems like your master is Facebook or Instagram and you pray by posting pictures. Okay, so uh, to sum up, I'm actually, that was nice. It was a historical uh, take on it. I'll, I'll guess move towards my concerns moving forward with authenticity. So um, Sarah spoke a lot about kind of digital versus analog and that helping us grapple with um, what we do in real life versus depict online. And I guess what I'll just throw out and not totally answer your question, but this, what I'm thinking about is when that line becomes more blurred. So when a virtual reality type um, recommender system driven um, authenticity is created that I'm existing um, in a more physical manifestation of these like um, advertiser driven um, automated versions of authenticity. How will that then kind of come into play? So what I mean by that is I think the line is going to be more blurred in the future when there are kind of like a physical manifestation of this like advertising driven um, experience, if you will. And it's, it's more, um, blurred between what's happening on my Instagram feed and what's happening in, in, in real life. Um, and to me, that's kind of a, that's when it's going to get very scary when you can't really parse out what has been. And I know we don't know what Facebook is doing, but it's still this distinctive platform I, I log into on my phone. I know when I'm using it, but when we're wearing technology and it's physically embodied, I think this notion of authenticity will, will um, blur and, and change. Cool. Um, I suspect we have time for one or two more if anybody else has a question. Um, I'm really enjoying the image now of Plato sitting for a bust of the back of his head. <laughs> so authentic. This, this is for anybody. I know we're talking a lot about authenticity. It's just really interesting. I was quickly scrolling through the live authentic hashtag on my phone as you're talking. I saw a lot of coffee, but I didn't see any booze. Is there is there a moral element to it, do we think? Can you guys talk about that? Yeah, I, I think another thing to note 
um, I found that the live authentic hashtag is also very used um, in Christian communities. It's like kind of this trendier reclaiming of this, I don't know, neo-pastoral kind of, I don't know, something. But I think all of it is kind of a moral judgment of oneself and others by performing kind of this ideal lifestyle. And yeah, I think that there's, you're not seeing booze. You're not seeing, I said booze like such a old one, booze. <laughs> um, <laughs> booze. Uh, yeah, there's like a lot of things that aren't aren't pictured in that. And I think in general that doing the live authentic, like participating in that aesthetic, championing that aesthetic as somehow more real is very much steeped in like moral judgments of what is the life well lived, right? And yeah, so. Uh, or just wellness. True. Coffee. Yep. Because coffee we think of as healthy food, probably less so. Right. Nature healthy an urban landscape less authentic. Um, and if you're going to see booze, it's probably like microbreweries. Yeah. You know, it has to have that craft to it, I think. So, yeah. Uh, I suspect we have time for one more question. I wasn't going to ask it, but now I'm really excited because I want to ask it. So, Lil Michaela, I would really like to talk about her because I feel like she's a really... So, Lil Michaela is... Um, the CGI Instagram character who um, I think is a really interesting character in the terms of like authenticity and like this creation on Instagram and I think lives in this space between what is real and what is not. And I would just like to know your thoughts on that because I think there was like this whole like situation where she was trying or like she was hacked and I think she was trying to establish her, the, the character or the profile was trying to establish itself as a real person at the end of the day with emotions and feelings. And I would just like to know what your thoughts are on that whole situation, Sarah and Claire. <laughs> Or anybody. Or anybody, because it's a it's a very interesting like. Yeah. Also, another one is Shudugram, which is another like. It's just this whole like false um, kind of profile and character that's now erupting on Instagram, and it's like, where is the line between, you know. These identities and these like beings and it's kind of like what you're saying. It's like what's real, what's not. Yeah. I'll just I'll go back to my other point that. If that's already happening now, when little Michaela can be physically actualized in some way and robotic Michaela, like that scares me almost more. Um, now there's, we don't anthropomorphize Michaela <laughs> or little Michaela as much as when maybe her marketing team will create a little Michaela. Um, so I still am partially like, like, I find it, I'm put at ease by this still idea that you have to go onto Instagram to engage with Michaela. I'm scared when Michaela is, 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 is more embedded in existence. And I, I'm not familiar with her. Go ahead. No, you do it. Uh, <laughs> I think little Michaela and the idea of her yeah, raises way more questions than answers. And I think that that's, but that's good. I, so I don't really have answers as more as like questions. Like I wonder, because it's still, for those who don't know who Lil Michaela is, uh, yeah, she presents herself through her captions as a real person with feelings, et cetera, but is very clearly digitally animated. But it's unclear, for example, if animators fully go in and create her like from scratch or digitally alter potentially a physical person to look like that. That's still not clear. And I feel like that presents kind of this interesting question of in even our own self-editing and visual presentation, at what point do, right? Then it becomes this spectrum of what, like a real person is if there can be like this digital person created from scratch or if Lil Michaela isn't real but maybe she's physically based on someone else and then there's us who maybe use Facetune or filters or edits there then becomes this interesting spectrum of us being mediated as people and identities so I don't really have an answer it's just like more an <laughs> interesting spectrum that I think we're entering into and grappling with. I'm so glad that in the spirit of academia, we're ending with more questions than when we started. 
Um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, I would love a healthy round of applause for our panelists, for Jeff, Jane, Sarah, and Claire.